inside a tunnel system carved from the solid limestone bedrock, in the desert of Egypt, lay 24 black granite boxes cut with the precision our modern technologies, do not possess. Shaped from as one granite and extremely hard stone. These massive boxes remain a profound mystery for scholars who are unsure as to what their true purpose was, or indeed how old they are. Numerous well-known figures have concluded the hieroglyphics written upon them is of such poor quality it is regarded as graffiti, many people believe Egyptian kings claimed precision made ruins as their own. This is one of the main hypotheses put forward for the Egyptians lack of any records of the pyramids construction, often decorating them in a more primitive form of writing style. The suspected sarcophagi range in weight between 50 and 100 tons. Their real purpose or maybe indeed their function, remains unclear, although they were clearly of importance, they were cut with such precision in fact they would have remained airtight for eons. Researchers like Brian Foster theorize they are clear examples of lost ancient high technology, created before the time of the dynastic Egyptians. Whatever their true purpose was, the truth is that they are beyond magnificent. Well-regarded studies for example, into the erosion evident on the sphinxes of Giza, have proven to indicate they may be far older than the Egyptian civilizations. By several hundred thousand years, some even claiming they show evidences of past submersions. The Serapium of Saqqara is located to the northwest of the famous Pyramid of Djosa. This necropolis found near Memphis, Egypt, is believed in modern academia, to have been built sometime around 1300 BC, by Ramesses II. Just what kind of technology, or indeed what kind of man, could have cut, transported, stacked and placed blocks of stones weighing up to 100 tons on top of each other with such accuracy? On the 25th of January, 2011, the streets of Cairo were being ravaged by a rioting population, demanding the end of President Hosni Mubarak's 30-year regime. While the world was distracted by the dramatic scenes of chaos upon the streets above, deep within the ancient dusty tunnels, a team of archaeologists led by Suzanne Bickel of the University of Basel in Switzerland was quietly making one of the most significant discoveries of the past century. They had initially found the top of a large round stone at the eastern end of the Valley of the Kings. The archaeologists suspected that it was just the top of an abandoned shaft, but before they could investigate, due to Egypt's political process regarding finds within the valley, they had to cover the stone rim with their own locked iron door, inform the Egyptian authorities and apply for an official permit to excavate. A year later, after gaining approval to excavate, Bickel returned with a team of two dozen people, including field director Elena Paula Goth of the University of Basel, Egyptian inspector Ali Rita, and local workmen. Each took turns lying on the ground, head pressed against the shaft wall, 
one arm through a small hole next to the capstone, snapping photographs. They left little doubt that it was indeed an ancient tomb. On top of the debris rested a dusty black coffin, carved from sycamore wood and decorated with large yellow hieroglyphs on its sides and top. Bickle has stated that she has never seen an Egyptian coffin in such a good condition before. The dating of fragments of pottery made from Nile silt and pieces of plaster, commonly used to seal tomb entrances in ancient times, together with the age of the other nearby sites, have indicated that the tomb could be more than 3,000 years old. The hieroglyphs describe the tomb's occupant as being named Nahimi's Bastet. Egyptologists currently believe she was a lady of the upper class and of Amun. People have been claiming there was nothing new left to find in the Valley of the Kings for almost as long as they have been digging there. The Venetian antiquarian Giovanni Belzoni believed he had emptied the last of the valley's tombs during his 1817 expedition, while Theodore Davis, who excavated there a century later, came to a similar conclusion right before Tutankhamun's burial chamber was found. Fortunately, there is a growing number of people who are beginning to suspect that there is a wealth of discoveries still left to be made in the Valley of the Kings, the Nile Delta, and Egyptian as a whole. And thanks to discoveries such as these, interest in these existing mysteries grows by the day. It is interesting to see that in this period, even a wealthy girl was buried with quite simple things, Bickle says, comparing Nahim's Bastet's coffin and steel with the elaborate pottery, furniture, and food found in earlier tombs. Her wooden coffin was certainly quite expensive, she says, but nonetheless, it lacked the elaborate inner coffins found in similar burials. Is this the burial chamber of an extremely ancient queen? After reinforcing the coffin and securing the mummy, Bickle's team have transported across the Nile to Luxor, where a full investigation is currently being undertaken into the true identity of the mystery female. With substantial insight into the controversial finds within ancient Egypt, we personally suspect that often the tombs, which appear the most crudely designed, containing wooden sarcophagus, are generally found to be the most ancient. Furthermore, their hieroglyphic writings were often far more exquisite in nature. Could this be the discovery of an original burial, and the crude hieroglyphic claim of the occupant's identity a fake, hiding the delta's true antiquity? A secret many fringe scientists have begun to believe is being protected by Egyptian antiquities. Many have come to suspect the Egyptians merely copied the original builders of the pyramids after taking occupation of their structures many years later. Supportive evidence for these claims comes in many forms. Erosion upon the pyramids, and especially the Sphinx, including over 100 underground chambers we are currently researching, discovered under Giza in 1995 by a team led by Kent Weeks, which also show strong evidence of several flash flooding events involving seawater throughout their long existence. The lack of any written detail pertaining to the construction of either monument in any hieroglyphs found in ancient Egypt, and so on. We find it incredibly intriguing that more was not made public regarding this amazing find, which leads us to suspect it may be a highly important, albeit highly controversial, discovery. We will continue to do research on Nahem's Bastet and we'll endeavor to keep you all informed regarding any notable findings. The Terracotta Army, undoubtedly the most astonishing collection of carvings, whether mold-based or not, to be found anywhere on Earth. The artistic genius on display within this large Terracotta Army is hard to ignore when, according to academia, they were merely the handiwork of untrained slaves. Not only does the Army display an immense level of detail, and thus artistic talent. They are also all seemingly unique, as if each soldier was an accurate recreation of an ancient individual in full armor. We have, in the past, covered this astonishing discovery, discussing how the temple in which this army is said to be protecting has supposedly never been opened, this even though upon excavating the original entranceways, 
sophisticated crossbows tipped with poison arrows were found left each on a butterfly trigger like something straight out of an Indiana Jones movie. Whatever these elaborate defenses were protecting has, according to Chinese authorities, never been explored. What's more, this same notoriously secret government have also made any future digs illegal, quashing all hopes for anyone who would like to know about this clearly intriguing section of history. However, these incredible features, along with the soldiers' average giant sizes, were not the only area of study we have explored regarding the army. In our first video regarding the amazing site, we explored the highly mysterious monoatomic pigment that was found on many of the statues, popularly known as Han Purple. This astonishingly complex pigment, although apparently sourced and manufactured in enormous amounts by a far less capable, more primitive ancestor, was not fully understood until the 1990s. A pigment that, according to scientists who have studied it, exhibits characteristics of, quote, an element of a lower dimension, end quote, and as such, according to mainstream paradigm, is an incredibly difficult artifact to explain. Yet, Han Purple is not the only incredible, highly enigmatic pigment dating from a now lost antiquity. There also exists another, no less impressive pigment, which is highly likely to have originated within the now lost civilization we like to call the Pyramid Builders. Known as Egyptian Blue, this marvelous pigment was found during an investigation by the British Museum. The Parthenon marbles, also known as the Elgin marbles, are a collection of classic Greek marble statues, whose history, although heavily documented, display upon their surface not only evidence of an advanced ancient knowledge, most probably a leftover, still in circulation within top masons and sculptors around the time of the statue's creation. But this pigment, found during an in-depth investigation of the marbles, to discover whether they were once painted or not, was found in varying quantities upon their varying features, not only subsequently proving beyond doubt that the statues were indeed once painted, but like that of Han Purple within China, Egyptian blue also has a highly curious characteristic discovered by modern technology. It is not only the sole surviving pigment on the statues, but is only visible within the infrared spectrum, a band invisible to the human eye. Made under the supervision of the architect and sculptor, Phidias and his assistants, the origin of the pigment, however, just like that of Han Purple, is unknown. Where did the knowledge for creating this pigment come from? Why is it now lost? Why does it emit colors invisible to the modern man's eye? We find not only Egyptian blue's infrared characteristics, but also Han Purple's intriguing dimensionally deficient resonance as highly compelling. The ancient ruins of Egypt, regardless of their astonishing characteristics, or the often enormous megalithic building blocks used in the site's construction, are still claimed by an academia with no explanation as to how, as the work of our well-studied yet far more recent ancestors, the Egyptians. It is one of the most crucial ancient locations when it comes to exposing the conspiratorial nature of academia, a denial of the obvious by those who were faithfully tasked with explaining the origins of said sites or indeed how said sites were created. Any of these long-awaited answers, however, remain elusive. For in reality, no one knows who built the ancient pyramids of Giza, how they did it, when they did it, or indeed why. We simply cannot explain how these feats of engineering and architecture were accomplished. For although such ruins are claimed as a particular group's work, there is no logical reasoning that can be provided to confirm this claim. Additionally, there are many other, no less gigantic megalithic blocks which can be found throughout Egypt, often found used within the many temples, but also seen buried, concealed within the foundations, which make up part of the floor at the pyramid's bases. And Dendera Temple is of no exception. We have covered the temple in the past, focusing on an intriguing depiction which many have come to conclude depicts a lost lighting technology. Some individuals have now created working replicas of this intriguing device. 
We have also covered the steps found within the temple. These steps appear to have been melted at some point in the past, rather than simple entropy. The temple, however, possesses many more inexplicable secrets, all concealed from the majority of Earth's population by a field of study that firstly lacks any demonstrative evidence, but also due to the evidence which one can mount to support the positive past stone-cutting power technology having once existed, thus these features are effectively ignored and thus largely overlooked. Copper chisels cannot explain its existence. People who have explored the temple have found that the repeating reliefs within are perfectly symmetrical identical in form to within millimeters of each other. The leaching of salts between surfaces are the only reasons we can see the joints in the Great Hall. Furthermore, Chris Dunn, a fellow antiquarian, has explored these intriguing clues within Dendera Temple previously. Not only did the precision of the carving stun Chris Dunn, but the finish upon such a brittle stone has led Chris to conclude that high technology was once utilized to create the stone carvings. Who built Dendera? What technologies were used to construct the temple? Or indeed, ancient Egypt as a whole? Dendera is undoubtedly a jewel in the crown, a now lost antiquity, one which we find highly compelling. Throughout our time researching ancient antiquities, we have stumbled across many anomalies which, to this day, the questions we have raised regarding these sites have yet to be satisfactorily answered by anyone. How did ancient, seemingly post-cataclysmic civilizations accomplish such feats of ancient engineering? Not only are there countless ancient structures found on nearly every continent on Earth that are beyond modern capabilities but the way in which they were liberated from the quarries and bedrock in which they were sourced, often many miles away, remains a burning question. Furthermore, the clues to these now lost techniques, the knowledge and indeed tools used to create these monstrous megaliths, the fingerprints of these now long forgotten activities still remain all over the hard granites once selected and used. No matter the geographical separation many of these sites share, it seems was not an issue, and they not only match, but as we have previously postulated based on said data, would appear to have been created with not only the same tools and techniques, but by a civilization whose tentacles far outstretch modern paradigms in regards to a single super-civilization having once been responsible for these extraordinary acts of ancient engineering. How can we continue to believe such sites were the work of academically shared, subsequently studied, in depth, and thus proven civilizations which we now know to have been incapable of such feats? The unfinished obelisk of Aswan, the megaliths of Yangshan Quarry, the polygonal astonishing feats of the mountaintop temples of Peru, and so on all share the same scars upon the weather-resistant rocks used in said structures. India, China, Peru, Egypt, and so on. Yet interestingly, different stone-cutting techniques are found upon different locations, yet seemingly coalesce within Aswan Quarry and other structures such as the Great Pyramids within Egypt. Diagonally cut stones, such as those within Baalbek and much further afield, are present within this quarry within Egypt. However, what makes the location of these massive pyramids special is that from the data, the evidence we have gathered, the structures were either built before said civilizations arrived and subsequently flourished upon our planet, but that these enormous structures were shared, possibly even an intercontinentally shared accomplishment achieved by not one, but many ancient super-civilizations which, it would appear, were even more capable than that of modern man. These butter-cut stones, such as the techniques seemingly used upon the abandoned obelisk of Aswan, are shared with many other sites, protuberances found within Peru and many other polygonal sites, are also present upon the pyramids, yet are seemingly much later additions. However, they are not only present on ruins around the world also, 
but the tool marks we have used to separate these sites are present within Egypt in abundance. The only other place we have witnessed such shared anomalies is Bazda Caves in Turkey, used by us to not only identify these techniques, but to pinpoint which lost civilization were where, and thanks to the pyramids, it would seem when. They not only share these marks, which are present all over structures across the world, but are only utilized in their fullest upon these two sites, so far discovered. Only shared at these particular sites and nowhere else found so far. However, interestingly, Baalbek seems to also share protuberances with other polygonal sites, but also possesses curious semicircular crescent-shaped tool marks across its biggest megaliths, as if a less accomplished tool than that used, we would postulate later, after these techniques were mastered, as found within Aswan, Sacsayhuaman, and many other apparently more advanced ruins found elsewhere on Earth. Who were these ancient people? How did they accomplish such astonishing feats of ancient engineering? We not only find the pursuit of answers to such questions incredibly important to the development of our knowledge in regard to our origins, but is a quest we will always find highly compelling. There are many ancient mysteries still to be unraveled within ancient Egypt, and although they are rarely academically shared, the basalt floor found upon the Giza Plateau being one such feature located at the base of the Great Pyramids, possess some of the most compelling fragments of ancient advanced machinery anywhere on Earth, let alone Egypt. Additionally, there does indeed exist other areas upon the Giza Plateau that also exhibit these unquestionably compelling fingerprints left by an as yet not understood ancient advanced technology. One such place, known as Abu Ghraib, is a place that many alternative researchers assert could have once been some sort of ancient stargate. Originally built as a sun temple, constructed to represent the ritually vivifying power of the sun god Ra, it was one of six temples built upon the site. However, only two have been identified, Yuzerkov and that of Nayusera. At the base of the site, at the western end, an enormous obelisk has also been unearthed, which, according to experts, symbolized the resting place of the sun god Ra. The obelisk's base is a pedestal, with sloping sides and a square top. It is approximately 20 meters high and is constructed of red granite and limestone. Estimates of the combined height of the obelisk and base vary, although a number of independent researchers believe when the structure was built, the total height of the obelisk was most likely somewhere between 50 and 70 meters in height, an enormous height and indeed weight for any of the currently attested ancient Egyptian builders to have worked with. But what we find the most intriguing regarding this obelisk, and indeed ancient site, linking back to the advanced anomalies located upon the basalt floor is the enigmatic drill holes found driven straight through the heart of this monolith, and many of the other large granite stones which still litter the site, the holes undoubtedly completed using some form of high-rotation power tool. Clear, compelling evidence that whoever created this ancient work had access to astonishingly advanced technologies. Additionally, the site is also home to a number of enormous red granite blocks each weighing in at several tons. Curiously, these massive blocks also exhibit the same uncanny precision cuts and extremely well-polished surfaces which are also found throughout ancient Egypt and the quarries thereof. All once mounted into position with such incredible precision, many investigators have concluded after visiting the site, just like the conclusions one is left with after exploring ancient Baalbek that whoever laid these massive stones into position had an extraordinary technological prowess. Why does modern academia continue to deny such truths in favor of such mundane and incomplete testimonies as to the true origins and builders of ancient Egypt? 
how can we continue to be expected to believe in the face of such compelling, overwhelming evidences, that these sites were merely the work of our more modern copper-wielding ancestors. It is undoubtedly highly compelling. We have in the past covered a vast array of evidence which suggests the past existence of giants. Yet, alas, much of what is or has now either unfortunately been suppressed, destroyed, stolen, or forgotten about, with the remains of their initial discoveries now often only to be found remaining, proverbially, cast in stone in the form of the library archives of the world and the news reports now digitally preserved within. Often follow-up reports abruptly ceased after the mention of the rapid arrival and insatiable interest of the Smithsonian, among others in said finds. However, now, thanks to the popularity of such subjects, the power and speed of modern technology, such finds made during excavations involving a large array of individuals make modern cover-ups difficult and are rarely accomplished. With the only modern, almost openly admitted one of note, having followed the discovery of the supposed tomb of Osiris, when all media was immediately banned from the site. When permitted back, the tomb had already been penetrated and was subsequently claimed as having been found empty, supposedly previously looted. This regardless of its near impenetrability, with Gantenbrink only making it successful with modern robotics. But I digress. Working in cooperation, a team involving the Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities, a team from the Penn Museum, University of Pennsylvania, among others, discovered a sarcophagus academically claimed as having belonged to a, quote, King Sobekteheb, probably Sobekteheb the first dated 1780 BC during the 13th dynasty. What we find astonishing regarding the find, however, is its sheer size. Carved from a single quarried piece of Aswan granite, initially weighing hundreds of tons, this finished tomb still weighs a minimum of 60 tons. It was somehow transported to the burial site and placed seemingly with delicacy where it now lay. Its resting place, inner chamber, also some three meters in length. The baffling enigmas of why such size? How were they moved? To explain how these feats were accomplished is far less difficult challenge if one incorporates into their postulations the possibility that the size of these tombs were, in fact, made to measure, indeed a match, to the height and scale of the civilization who buried them. Could the inclusion of ancient giants into the many other theories surrounding the mysteries of Giza solve the puzzle we still can't solve of how these stones were moved? It is a hypothesis which we find very fitting. We most recently covered the remarkable discovery, fortunately made in the presence of numerous parties from a number of international research panels, including media personnel. Fortunate for reasons we previously covered in our last video regarding the difficulty when such an event occurs in such a situation to suppress it in the modern age and the subsequent unusual characteristics of said discovery. A discovery the world has been fortunate to witness further cementing mounting evidence for the past existence of an ancient giant civilization. With this next discovery, although completely different in characteristics, we feel its scale alone, with other intriguing features, makes it as equally perplexing, an apparent polar opposite approach in some areas, such as methodology and symbology, even including stone selected. Yet another enigmatic mystery currently sprouting up all over the Giza Plateau. What we found initially interesting was, just like the other enormous tomb we have covered prior, its sheer size, estimated at nearly 9 feet tall and 3.5 feet wide just on the insides. Amazingly, it also initially appeared and was initially presumed to have still somehow been a mysteriously hermetically sealed tomb. This is where the open presses line runs out, unfortunately, for although it would seem the sarcophagus has indeed been opened, 
it has been done privately by the Smithsonian Institute. The details of what was found inside, what sort of remains, and indeed their claimed identity, continue to be a closely guarded secret and a subject of hot debate, with the Smithsonian merely stating, further examinations on the body found inside are being conducted. According to the head of Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities, quote, there has been a remarkable find in the coastal city of Alexandria. During a routine excavation, experts uncovered a baffling Ptolemaic stone sarcophagus. It has been hailed as a major find, as it can provide insights into the great Hellenistic period in Egypt and its unique culture." End quote. Regardless of academic historians and certain institutions instantly pushing the notion that they know all about this incredible find, and also what exactly could have been found within that black sarcophagus, we find the ordeal highly compelling. One of the oldest, most widely recognized gods through ancient Mesoamerica is a being known as Tlaloc. Worshipped as a giver of life and sustenance, he was also feared for his ability to send hail, thunder, and lightning, and for being the lord of the element water. Appearing in many forms throughout Aztec history, as usually water-dwelling creatures such as amphibians, could his roots actually date back to the so-called Great Deluge, which has been noted in so many ancient religions throughout the world? Undoubtedly, the most impressive depiction of Tlaloc, which can be found anywhere, is his megalithic statue, found in the small town of Coatlachan. Clearly once a pilgrimage site, what's impressive regarding the statue is its size, weighing in at an estimated 168 tons the largest existing monolith in the Americas. Made from basalt, the workable stone for this monumental artwork was, at some point, transported to this spot in preparation for carving. The question is, how did our ancient ancestors move such enormous lumps of basalt, similar in size to those of the Moe statues, synonymous with Easter Island? Why did this ancient people revere water gods so much? Were these gods inspired by traumatic memories and legends left to them by their ancestors? Possibly a surviving fragment of the once flourishing civilization responsible for so many now unexplainable sites all over the world. Intriguingly, according to Aztec belief, Tlaloc was a god primarily connected with meteorological phenomena that was related to water. In 1963, the National Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City, decided that the monolith should be placed at the entrance of the museum. The people of Coatlinchan eventually agreed to this request on the condition that a government road, a school, and a medical center be built in their city. On the 16th of April 1964, the monolith began its journey to Mexico City. The monolith of Tlaloc was transported on the back of a giant purpose-built trailer over a distance of about 30 miles. When the monolith arrived in the capital, it was greeted by a crowd of 25,000 people. Upon its arrival, the location mysteriously experienced an unusual storm. Clearly, an incredible ancient artifact, which we find highly compelling. There are many ancient anomalies which can be found upon the Giza Plateau and indeed across much of ancient Egypt as a whole. Many areas which are clear evidence of a highly capable, highly intelligent past civilization who once called this landmass home. Not only are the ancient pyramids a clear feat of incredible ancient engineering, possibly the most astonishing found the world over, but many of the still existing ancient temples are testament to a now lost, yet once incredibly advanced ancient civilization. And although many academics are funded to push the theory that the pyramids, having once been the burial places of Egyptian kings, the truth that we still do not actually know the original purpose for these ancient structures remains. Not only do these structures, along with many other areas, such as the basalt floor found at their feet, 
still show clear evidence of lost technology, unquestionably left by high-speed, high-rotation stone-cutting technologies, and many of the tombs and other artifacts found throughout the ancient ruins, unarguably once machine-worked upon enormous, as yet unexplained lathes. But there also exist some astonishing features within the record books, documented anomalies within our own antiquity regarding some of the biggest yet still existing anomalies within ancient Egypt, anomalies that although are now all but lost to history, have been recorded and documented since our own records began, specifically Roman records. The Colossi or Colossus of Memnon are listed as containing some of the largest megalithic blocks that have currently been recorded and investigated across the world, and although these statues have virtually crumbled over the eons, Records of these statues stretches back many centuries, features now largely, and we believe, deliberately ignored by mainstream academics. These statues once possessed an astonishing characteristic, one many claimed as a divine experience, one which would draw countless individuals on a pilgrimage across the desert, to witness at first light every morning. The Colossi of Memnon were built from a single piece of stone each. They are oriented towards the sunrise at winter solstice, and throughout modern study have had a number of fearless individuals expose their true past grandeur to the world. Estimates for the two statues' original weight are most commonly noted to have been around the 1,000 tons mark, with the most famous report within R. T. Gould's A Book of Marvels, 1937, which contained an estimate of 1,200 tons. The statues are made from blocks of quartzite sandstone, which was quarried at El Gabal El Amar, near modern-day Cairo, then transported 420 miles to Thebes. And although modern academia would like to attribute these feats to our more modern ancestors, namely the ancient Egyptians, any logical explanation of how this feat was achieved, or indeed how they were so precisely carved, remains absent from all explanations of these monumental statues, not only their transport and creation, but how these ancient monuments used to sing. Early Greek and Roman tourists who came to hear the sound gave the statue the name of Memnon. Memnon was a hero of the Trojan War, a king of Ethiopia, who led his armies to Troy's defense, but was ultimately slain by Achilles. Memnon was said to be the son of Eos, the goddess of dawn, and after his death, his mother is said to have shed tears every morning. The singing of the statues was attributed to this mother mourning for her son. The earliest written reference to the singing statues comes from the Greek historian and geographer Strabo, who claimed to have heard their song during a visit in 20 BC. The second-century Greek traveler and geographer Pausanias compared it to the string of a lyre breaking. Others described it as the striking of brass or a strange, ghostly, almost divine whistling. For more than two centuries, the singing statues brought tourists from all over the empire, including several Roman emperors. Many left inscriptions on the base of the statue, reporting whether they had heard the sound or not. Nearly 90 inscriptions are still legible upon their base today. Who created these statues? How were they able to sing? They are clearly an astonishing ancient accomplishment, once achieved by a now lost advanced civilization. Monuments which we find highly compelling. Homes, towns, religious structures, an entire living infrastructure of a once highly successful, highly capable people. Managing to expertly fuse their existence harmoniously with the surrounding environment, creating structures which left little, if any, impact on the surrounding landscape, structures still usable even to this day. Located within Abanque, a province in the region of Apurimac, Sehuite has been conveniently dated to the period of the Incan Empire, between the 15th and 16th centuries AD. However, like many sites dotted around Peru, and indeed the world, an explanation as to how these cultures achieve such wonders with such primitive access to construction or tools is not forthcoming. Compared to other Incan sites, Sehuite is also a complete ruin, 
leading the more observant, and indeed the free-thinking, self-funded geologist among us, to suspect that it may actually be even older than the pre-Incas responsible for Machu Picchu. Yet the most noteworthy object at Sehuite, and the reason for our video, is its monolith. A mysterious boulder drenched in intricate, purposely placed carvings. Interestingly, the word Sehuite originated from the Quechua word Sehueta, which translates as place of orientation. The site is located on the top of a terraced hill. Dedicated research has also revealed that the site was once home to an enclosed sanctuary. Yet all that remains of this sanctuary today is a few leveled platforms and the monolith. It contains more than 200 geometric and zoomorphic figures, including reptiles, frogs, felines, topographical hydraulic models, complete with terraces, ponds, rivers, tunnels, and irrigation channels. The functions or purposes of the stone are not academically known, yet others suspect it was a map of the once existing complex created by a culture able of moving tremendous weights and carving stone with relative ease. Researcher Dr. Arlen Andrews Sr. believes the monolith was used as a scale model to design, develop, test and document the water flow for public water projects, and to teach ancient engineers and technicians the concepts and practices required. Quote, the rock was edited several times with new material, either altering the paths of the water or adding routes altogether. End quote. Clearly a remarkable artifact left by a remarkable civilization. Thanks for watching, guys, and until next time, take care. Countless arenas resulting in a continued academic perplexment still litter Egypt's Giza Plateau. The pyramids, the Great Sphinx, the enormous megalithic blocks which made them, not to mention the mountain of ancient yet clearly incredibly precise, seemingly highly advanced tool marks which can still be found across the still surviving fragment of its basalt floor. 1,000 plus ton ancient singing statues, mysterious staircases cut directly into an inexplicably enormous, mysteriously concrete-like plateau, one strong enough to continue to be the foundation for the Great Pyramids themselves. The burning question then remains, who built this magnificent place? And can it be proven that Along with these structures, not being the work of the currently claimed ancient Egyptians, but can be connected to countless other equally baffling ruins, a few even found in some of the most remote landmasses on Earth, proof, if there ever was, of a once highly advanced, ocean-going, world-dominant, yet now lost civilization. Menkari, as mentioned in a previous video, the smallest of the pyramids, has undeniable polygonal casing stones, masonry in the exact same style and stone as that of ancient Peruvian sites. Yet in addition to these granite blocks partly encasing Menkur, Aswan, its quarry with its gargantuan unfinished obelisk, and indeed its temple, are yet another series of undeniable proofs as to the true identity of the original builders of ancient Egypt. Although, due to the clear similarity of the polygonal masonry, a now lost yet unique technique of placing seemingly randomly shaped stones without mortar perfectly together, with that of Sacsayhuaman, Machu Picchu, along with many other, the Temple of Aswan, when looked upon closely, possesses polygonal perfection. Created to the same level of accuracy as that of Cusco, However, we feel, due to the medium of creation being softer, that of sandstone, their abilities and accuracy in producing this lost masonry technique, which has now been identified all over the world, really shines through. Are we looking at the proof needed to not only connect the most incredible, unexplainably ancient megalithic sites worldwide? Were the pyramids, ancient Peru, Easter Island, Ethiopia, the list goes on, all built by the same lost civilization. We find the evidence to support such claim highly compelling. <laughs>